Hello, I'm Gary Stearman, and this is the Christmas season. And here in studio to talk about this Christmas season of the year 2018 is Bob Ulrich. Bob, it's a great time to be alive. It sure is. Uh, Merry Christmas, Gary. Can Merry I Christmas say that? to you. We can say that on uh, Prophecy Watchers, although in a lot of places it's kind of forbidden these days. More so than ever. Uh, there seems to be a, an organized strategy to remove Christ and the Christmas story from this world. Now why would that be uh, something anyone would want to do? Well, because as the Bible clearly states, the world system is not controlled <clears throat> by the good guys. It's controlled by principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places, guided by the prince of the power of the air himself, and that would be Satan. And this year, when you watch TV, you see the Grinch, and you see Krampus, and you see these dark and sinister Christmas characters, and uh, the crash, the manger scene, suddenly has taken a back seat to all the cartoons, and uh, that's the spirit of the hour. Well, we have the spirit of Christmas here at Prophecy Watchers, and uh, it's become a controversial thing in some ways, even in Christian circles. Uh, you know, we're being told that we shouldn't celebrate Christmas, that Christmas is attached to the satanic calendar. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, if any and every calendar in use today is actually a compromise. <clears throat> the Jewish calendar compromises uh, in its particular way. Uh, the uh, Julian and Gregorian calendars compromise in their particular way. But we do remember the dark winter time when the shepherds raised uh, their sheep in, in that place called Migdal Adair. And that beautiful scene of shepherds watching over their flock by night, and they were raising the royal sheep uh, by the way, which we, would be taken up to Jerusalem and sacrificed according to the Jewish calendar. And so in a sense the Jewish calendar tells us about prophesied things, that is the coming of Messiah and his activities. Uh, since he died, was crucified and returned to heaven, uh, we switched over to another calendar. It too is a compromise because the true calendar is not going to be worked out until the millennium and the years thereafter. Well sometimes I think we give uh, the devil a little too much credit. Uh, we know that everything God declares to be good, he declares to be bad and tries to turn it into something bad. But you know Christmas and Easter are the two popular holidays to criticize, uh, tying them to Saturnalia and Ishtar and these right. celebrations. But on Christmas morning when we stand up in church and sing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Yeah. Or hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king. O come all ye faithful. I mean, do you really think the devil is standing up, you know, doing cartwheels, saying, They're singing my song. They're celebrating my satanic holiday. I'm sorry, we don't buy that here. I think the devil is a defeated enemy. And when we stand up in unison all over the world and sing those songs, what are we singing? We're announcing the birth of the Messiah. It can't make him very happy, can it? Not at all. In fact, <clears throat> there must be something right about Christmas for all the secular authorities to want to tear it down the way they do. I, I just read the story of a superintendent of a uh, public school system right here in America who outlawed the colors red and green in her school system, saying that we are a secular institution and the colors red and green are associated with the birth of Christ and therefore we are barring them in this season. So j this is the world we live in, Bob. Gary, you can't make this up. We've got candy canes now that are being banned because they look like a J and it could represent Jesus. Exactly. We've got a professor in Minnesota who actually is accusing, of God, accusing God of being a predator claiming you know, he impregnated Mary without her permission which if you read uh, the first chapter of Luke is just utterly ridiculous. But yet that's the world we live in today. You know, that's a good setting, Bob, to talk about something else. and Namely the cover of our December 2018 magazine, The Prophecy Watcher, right on the cover here, 
uh, is a beautiful Christmas ornament. Uh, and it has the manger scene. It has Joseph and Mary and the baby and it has the shepherds and the wise men and it's a gorgeous Christmas ornament. The title of the article that I wrote is The World's Greatest Christmas Gift. And of course you know what the world's greatest Christmas gift actually is. It's Jesus himself. And from him comes the entire idea of, uh, of the new birth. He was the first of those to be born again. And then of course he was sacrificed and the whole idea in Christianity is uh, symbolized in the new birth. And every year as Christmas rolls around uh, traditionally, hey, it may not be the year that Jesus, or the, the month that Jesus was born. We don't hold to December 25th as his actual birthday. But it's sort of tradition uh, to celebrate his birth and uh, for one reason or another, and we could talk about that for a long time but we don't have the time, for one reason or another Bob we settled on December 25th and you could say oh that's an evil date. No it's, it's just a traditional date when people gather in the darkest days of the year to bring light into the world remembering that Jesus came into the world as light. Well we're well aware that Jesus was born in the fall. Yeah, uh, We know that for certain. There were shepherds abiding in the fields watching their flocks by night. Right. So if we go back nine months to the actual point of conception, that brings us somewhere in the vicinity of Hanukkah, doesn't it? It does. In fact, uh, there's a lot that we can say about Hanukkah, the 24th of Kislev, which always falls very close to our current Christmas. It, it's a floating date, so the, the two never merge. Some years they do, some years they don't. But it was in that season uh, the, that uh, uh, I think uh, Mary conceived the Lord. And if you do a little calendrical work you discover that uh, he was born right around the time of Rosh Hashanah which is called the birthday of the world. By the way I've included in this article the world's greatest gift, that, that idea. Uh, we're not worshiping a date, uh, we're not worshiping even a place. Uh, or a tradition. We, we uh, honor these traditions because they're, they've been handed down to us for centuries, but we understand what they really mean. The Son of God was born bringing light into the world. It, his birth was the most documented event in human history uh, and every year around this time we remember that. And of course the Jewish people mark uh, your actual birthday around the date of conception, exactly. the actual date of uh, physical birth. So uh, the numbers actually match up. Now I just want to say this article Gary's written in the magazine has so much provocative material in it we could probably make ten television programs out of just some of the high points of the article. So this is a magazine you're going to want to get. This is an issue you're going to want to get. Gary made a comment to me a few minutes before we started the program uh, and basically said there are things in the Bible that we gloss over, that we read and don't really understand, things that are literally world-changing, life-changing, things that we never really wrap our arms around because we simply don't understand the depth of teaching in the Scripture. You know, most people read the Bible at a surface level and never really get that deep into the background. That's why I just laugh when I hear people say this is a book of Jewish fables and folk stories that somebody collected together. You know when you read the genealogy in Matthew, something that we all probably have glossed over from time to time, and you understand the actual importance of some of the things in the Scripture and why they're put in the Scripture for us to understand. Most Christians never get there. They have no clue what happened in the genealogies. But I know you need to talk about that because it's really important. Well let's begin to talk about uh, the gift that is the greatest, uh, the world's greatest gift which is the birth of Christ. Let's talk about the two genealogies in the, in the New Testament. And Bob we really don't have time to cover it all in this brief program except to say that the genealogy given to us by Matthew is a, a royal lineage. And so when we turn over to, uh, to Matthew chapter 1 it has 17 verses the book of the generation uh, of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Wow, okay, that's enough to think about right there. Uh, keeping a genealogy from Abraham up to the birth of Christ, and it's documentary, meaning this really happened. And 
And what, ha- what follows is, is called the royal lineage of Jesus Christ. There's another uh, uh, genealogy in Luke which is the legal lineage. That is, the, the, uh, it gives Christ the legal right to the throne of Israel. The one in Matthew gives Jesus the royal right. And it is just phenomenal to study these two genealogies and contrast and compare how they work. But what they do is absolutely document the authority of the man Jesus. That is, when he came it was not a haphazard situation. It went all the way back to Abraham and it was done for the purpose of bringing salvation, bringing light into the world. And how that gets lost at the Christmas season is amazing to me. Well, it's, it's so deep and so complicated, most Christians never really study it because we right. skip over the genealogies because nobody's interested in who begat who and why, except that when you dig into those genealogies and you realize it leads to Jesus Christ and His right to the royal throne and how it got there and the curse that's involved in it that most people don't realize either. Talk about the curse of uh, Jeconiah. Yeah, in the royal uh, lineage you start with uh, going back to Abraham and you have names. So and so begot so and so begot so and so and you come up to verse 10 of chapter 1 and it says, And Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And so one of the participants here is Jeconiah uh, and if you go back to Jeremiah chapter 22 you get the whole story of Jeconiah and how God cursed him because he was such an evil man. He lorded it over the people. He was an evil, evil king. Uh, he, He essentially enslaved the Jews. And the Lord detested Jeconiah and changed his name by to Coniah by removing the J-E, which is the Jehovah prefix. Now we've seen this before. We've seen uh, Abraham's name change. We've seen Sarah's name change. We've seen uh, Jacob's name change. And so here is another name change literally from, from the hand of God. And so people look at this and they say, wait a minute, Jeconiah is cursed. He's in the lineage of Jesus. How can Jesus sit on the throne if there's a curse on one of the kings? And the answer is found when you go all the way to the end (coughs) of uh, this particular genealogy. And what you find out is that uh, Jacob begat Joseph, son of Mary of whom was born Jesus who is called Christ. When you carefully examine this genealogy, and I have this in the magazine by the way, we don't have time to talk about it. God reinstated the absolute authority of this genealogy by causing Christ to be born of a virgin, thereby cutting out the human fault. That's a fascinating, it's a fascinating read when you get into it. It is. Now real quick, let's talk about Bethlehem. Uh, you know, here you have this, this pregnant woman with child and mm-hmm. Mary and Joseph you know, were supposedly uh, called up to pay, according to the English Bibles, a tax all the world should be taxed is the actual quote, but what does it really say, Gary? It really says registered. Mm. That is, there was a royal uh, registry that was absolutely, firmly put forth as law throughout all Roman territory. And uh, at that time Israel had been captured and and was under uh, Roman uh, rule. And throughout the empire uh, there was a a decree that went forth that you had to go to your hometown, you had to sign a census sheet. But what it was, it was called a registration. If you really look, read the, the language of this and look at the history, it was not a, uh, if you will, uh, a registration for the purpose of uh, census. It was a registration for the purpose of discovering whether or not you had any royal blood. And if you did you were in real trouble because the <laughs> Romans didn't want a, an, someone who claimed royal authority to pop up in one of the provinces and say, okay I am suitable to be king, follow me people and we're going to rise against Rome. That's what would have happened. So this was almost a political 
uh, a political registration rather than, I'm, I'm not sure they cared how many people there were. That's right. It but was not a census. But there was something about Mary and Joseph that was a, a perceived threat to the Roman kingdom. And they had to go back to Bethlehem, birthplace of uh, their son. And they were both residents of Bethlehem. That's where they entered their names in the royal registry. And as, as you know, they had to flee the country not, not long thereafter. Well, why did they have to flee the country? Well, King Herod uh, was had the, of the same mind as the Romans. He wanted to cut out anyone who could possibly rise against him as a legitimate ruler. So this takes us to the next, the next step and the next phase in the process to the shepherds in Bethlehem. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. I remember a Charlie Brown Christmas and little Charlie Brown and the kids all dressed up in Christmas costumes and they recited, actually recited scripture. This particular one, Luke 2, 8, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Well it just so happens that that field just to the north of Bethlehem was the royal sheepfold. That is, that is where the sheep for temple worship were, uh, were uh, raised. And the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night were temple shepherds. It's a matter of history. And there are a number of people that have written about this. Uh, Alfred Edersheim, if, you, if you'd like to read about it, wrote uh, a long chapter about the royal shepherds keeping watch over their flocks. In other words, the royal shepherds in the house of David keeping watch over their flocks by night and little baby Jesus was born in that field <laughs> right there by the shepherds. Well you make a comment here that is kind of a summary of what you're going to finish talking about. I don't want to jump ahead of you but I just read this. This is a great summary. When Jesus was born there were a whole lot of prophecies fulfilled. Yes. Old Testament prophecies and I do want you to get to that verse in Habakkuk that you read to me earlier. But your little summary statement here says at a precise moment in the timeline of human history in the city of David the Lamb of God came to the house of bread at the tower of the flock. What is the house of bread? Bethlehem. Bethlehem in English just means house of bread. And guess what? He was the bread of life. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 6 delivers an entire sermon about how I am that bread that came down from heaven. And the house of bread just happens to be Bethlehem. There are no coincidences, Bob. <laughs> there is well, a master plan. When, when you dig into this article, and what is it, six, eight, ten pages long, there are no accidents in yeah. the Scripture. There are no accidents in the birth of Christ uh, there are no accidents in the things that were prepared before, prepared before he was born, during his birth, or after he was born. These are all prophecies that were written thousands of years ago uh, when, uh, you know, Micah 5.2. I mean, I think Micah was written about 700 years before Christ was born. And it predicts the birth of Christ 700 years before he was born. And he was to be born at a place called Migdal Adair. And, and you can read all about Migdal Adair. In fact, in the article I, ref, I uh, re talk about it just a little bit. Uh, in in uh, English, Migdal Adair means the tower of the flock. Well, where was the tower of the flock? The tower of the flock was just north of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Which flock? The royal sheepfold. Well, let me read Micah 5 too, and it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that who is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now that's not a human being, is it? That's, that's right. It's not a human being at all. You know, uh, you mentioned a minute ago that uh, the name of Jesus can be found in the Old Testament. Habakkuk 3.13, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It says, and I'm reading the, the King James Version, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. And salvation with thine anointed in uh, Hebrew reads Yeshua et HaMashiach, <laughs> which is the name of Jesus in Hebrew. Wow. Right here in, in Habakkuk 3.13. 3, that's in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, yes. <laughs> Jesus' name written in Hebrew, and I'll read it again. 
it 's la Yeshua et Hamashiach, which means for the salvation of my people wow, incredible now. We've got two more major subjects to cover and we're running out of time quickly here. Yes, we are. We need to talk about the Magi and we need to talk about the gifts that they brought to the Christ child. Now who were the Magi? Well, the, the, the Magi, or the Magoi as they were called in Greek, were kingmakers who came from Babylon. <clears throat> they were wealthy beyond measure. They were politically powerful. They were in league with the Romans of that day. The Roman Empire extended all the way over, uh, almost to today's India. But uh, the Magi stood up against the Romans and essentially were so wealthy and so powerful in their uh, own land that they were able to say to the Romans, okay, thus far and no farther, we're going to do what we're going to do. And what they did was actually elect kings for the various countries in the Middle East. They were, they were the powers behind the throne. So when they rode into town and greeted Herod uh, the Great and said, we're, we're come here looking for the one who is born of God. We're come looking for the, uh, for the fabled Messiah. It scared Herod to death because here were the kingmakers. Now when they traveled, they traveled with Arabian style horses. In fact, they were the original breeders of what became the Arabian horses. They were equestrians and they hated camels. When they traveled, they traveled on horseback, they traveled with servants in uh, what we might call the early version of the Winnebago's. Trailers pulled by hundreds of of donkeys. They had cook shacks and cook trailers and sleeping trailers. And this is what came into, uh, into Jerusalem. Now hold on just a second. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought three gifts. And so that, yeah. there were three of them, right? Uh, there were hundreds of them. I've seen the pictures, Gary. There were three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were on horses. <laughs> Instead of three guys on camels, they, they, they rode Arabian horses. There were many, many of them. And then when they came to the Christ child, uh, as given in the Bible, uh, Jesus was at that time about 15 months old. So he was a toddler. So he wasn't a baby in a manger when a they arrived. He was a manger when the wise men came. And when they came and presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that was a royal attribution. But they came all the way from their land to the land of Israel to do one thing, to validate the royal birth of Jesus. And you talk about, and an angel even had to come a little bit later and say, don't go back through Jerusalem when you go mm. home. Take a, a different route because Herod is out to get you with his entire army. Now most people have never heard this before, but each of those gifts to the Christ child had a spiritual meaning. You know, it wasn't just they brought three things that were important to them. They might not have even known the meaning of what they were bringing, mm. but it was brought for a reason. Well, they, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now you've read the article. What's I gold? Have. Expensive. <laughs> Very expensive. <laughs> and in fact, the people who have the gold are the rulers. And so when they presented him with gold, they presented him with the tribute of rulership. Frankincense was the chief ingredient of the temple ketorah, that is, the incense that was burned in the holy temple. And uh, frankincense is considered the uh, the incense that represents a royal representative reaching up to God and the incense is, is, a, is a spiritual tribute to the fact that someone is qualified to actually go before God and offer prayer. So Frank, gold, the king. Frankincense, the priest. And myrrh, myrrh is the spice of death. It's associated with burial, embalming, uh, uh, when you prepared someone uh, for a funeral, you, myrrh was one of the chief spices that was used to uh, uh, cover the body in in a uh, sort of a votive way. It was kind of a purification. And so they they actually talked about Jesus in, in three tenses. He's king, he's priest, and he's going to die for his people. And so he did. Amazing. You summarize that here towards the end of your article, and I can't emphasize enough that there, there's so much material to dig deeper into the subject that I think is really important for 
uh, mature Christians to understand. You say, even at his infancy, the Magi recognized Jesus as king and priest, but they also foretold his death and burial. Looking backward, we now see the importance of his death and entombment during the feasts of Passover and unleavened bread. And when he arose at first fruits as the first of many who would be resurrected. So even at his birth, when he was giving these gifts, uh, his death was being uh, acknowledged as a future event. Absolutely. Bob, we're down to a couple of minutes. And the article entitled The World, the World's Greatest Gift, I, I hope you get a copy of Pro- The Prophecy Watcher and, and are able to read it in this Christmas season. But uh, I, I want to go out today talking about a Christmas gift that the Lord gave us. <laughs> and, and here it is right here. I want you to hold this, uh, this up, Bob. And uh, this is our new uh, operations building. And let's talk about what I consider to be an absolute gift from God. Well, it's an amazing experience uh, how all this came into being. Uh, We've had some issues here in our existing studio, uh, noise issues, sound issues, space issues. We've outgrown this current facility. It's grown to be a real source of frustration. And here several months ago through a series of circumstances that I do not want to call accidental, uh, God introduced us to a new headquarters for the Prophecy Watchers. It's the former Trinity Broadcasting Network here in Oklahoma City. It's their uh, their headquarters and their television studio here. And he literally has given us uh, a contract to purchase this building sometime in January. We'll probably be moving our headquarters over into a 13,200 square foot building with a 4,000 square foot soundproof television studio. What a blessing. What a blessing. And Bob, it's going to enable us to talk to more and more people about the world's greatest gift. Uh, you cannot outgive God. And, and I want to say a word here, and I'm going to leave it to Bob in just a moment, but uh, what I want to do is just say a great big thanks to all of you who have blessed us with your gifts. Believe me, uh, we have unspeakable gratitude. I mean, we, the words fail. But thank you so much for the gifts that you have given us. Right, Bob? So many people have gone over to prophecywatchers.com. They've made a major, major donation to help us acquire this building. We've actually purchased the building for about $75 a square foot, which is really remarkable if you know anything about construction costs. God's given right. us a beautiful facility. He's given us a soundproof television studio, soundproof radio studio. I mean, it's just an amazing opportunity at the hand of the Lord. Real quick before we sign off today, here's the magazine, The Prophecy Watcher. We've been offering a lifetime charter subscription to this publication for the last four years. It's coming to an end on December 31st. Go to prophecywatchers.com. For $100, you can subscribe to this publication for the rest of your life. And Bob, I'd like to wish all of of our viewers a very merry and a very blessed Christmas. And by the way, keep watching everybody. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.